Hello, welcome. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, I added a little one-on-one because I realized that there's a lot to talk about and I don't want to like, well, I don't have the time to delve into any of the bits really deeply um, and frankly there's probably more better people to, to delve into the various bits but we'll cover lots of bits on, on how games can be a therapeutic tool. Uh, I'm Eric Landon, uh, I work for Child's Play, um, thanks to Luke and Victoria for helping to get me here. Um, so who am I? So um, I worked for University of Washington Medical Center for 10 years, uh, running IT stuff there, projects and things. Uh, I was an analyst, I wasn't a coder, um, I sort of liaison between the coders and the, the clinical folks. And then I moved to Child's Play where I've been for five years. Uh, I volunteered for them for many years before that. Um, I realize that maybe not everyone knows what Child's Play is, so um, I will talk a little bit about that. So we're a charity. We, uh, our core business um, for the 16 or so years we've been around is providing games and toys and electronics to children's hospitals all around the world. Uh, we have a bunch here in Australia. Most of ours are in, our, in the US, um, but also Canada, the UK. Uh, we just got one in Kenya. We have one in India, um, all over the place. Um, the other thing we, we do that not everyone knows about, I guess, is we also work with them on how to use games more therapeutically. So um, game equipment is great, it's a great distraction, um, but they can be better tools than that. Um, so we try to work with the hospitals on what kinds of games, when to use them, um, not just games but tools, iPads and things like that as well, um, and that kind of thing. Um, the other thing we've started doing is most hospitals have as much equipment as they can manage. They don't have the staff to sort of, with the knowledge or skills or time uh, dedicated to manage Xboxes and Playstations and iPads and stuff like that. So we've started doing grants with hospitals to hire a game tech specialist. So someone that can work in the hospital with the child life or play therapy departments usually um, and can manage all the equipment, but then can also investigate VR and AR and telepresence and all the cool new texts that are coming. Oops, sorry. Um, that could be very useful in the hospital as well. Uh, and then the other parts of my role is to sort of be a sponge for uh, new gadgets and technologies and resources and websites and all that sort of stuff that can be useful in hospitals so that when I'm talking with the hospital folks, um, I can have those sort of knowledges ready because I never know what necessarily they're going to ask about. Uh, I am not a doctor, um, but I have um, uh, visited over 60 hospitals in the last four years uh, and chatted with the child life and play therapists and IT about their challenges, things that work for them, um, things that don't work. Um, attend tons of professional conferences, including uh, GEC, uh, Games for Change, um, a VR Healthcare Symposium. I've been to about 36 packs, I think. Um, lots of things like that. Uh, I read lots of studies and sort of try to keep up on different things and then um, I've seen and heard a lot of anecdotal evidence from various um, staff that we help with, um, either our partner hospitals or um, just chatting at conferences and that kind of stuff. There is research out there. Um, I'm not going to cover a lot of it in here just because I feel like uh, if you, if you uh, talk about research, you should really understand what that study was about, um, and I don't have time to delve into any of that. So, but trust me, um, if you, any of the specific topics um, that I bring up, or if you just want to Google like games healthcare research or game therapy research, there is a ton out there and there's more all the time, um, and delving into the specific topics as well. So uh, it is out there, it is mostly showing that um, all this stuff is great. Um, Obviously, there's some that, that show some things are better than others, but yeah, it is out there. Um, therapy versus self-help. So games are not, I don't want to say it's not the answer. It wasn't the right symbol I wanted, but um, they're not the only answer. So the games in themselves are not the answer. Um, they are a tool. Um, like every other tool, it is how you apply it and how you use it. Um, you all probably aren't healthcare professionals. Some of you may be. I don't want to say you're not. Um, but therapy is something that is done by a healthcare professional in general. So it's something that you know a, a doctor or, or a, a psychologist or, or a therapist, social worker or whatever, sort of you know, works with the patient on how to use this tool. Um, Self-help is something that you can just sort of, you read a book or you listen to a podcast or you, you know, do that kind of stuff. Um, and that's sort of, that sort of thing. So games can be useful in both cases. Uh, I just sort of wanted to, to clarify the differences, I guess, for when I'm talking about them. Um, 
just because you're not a healthcare professional doesn't mean you can't make uh, great tools that can be useful for professionals um, or for self-help. Um, most of the tools that, when I'm talking with healthcare professionals, most of the tools they're using right now are just off-the-shelf games uh, or off-the-shelf tools. They're not, they were not designed specifically for the therapy that they're being used for. Um, and just because you're a healthcare professional doesn't mean you can't benefit from games. Everyone can, uh, obviously. Um, why games for therapy? So there's a couple of reasons. Um, they have controllable situations. So they're um, scripted. Um, in many cases, obviously, some games are, not, are less scripted than others, but they're, they're controllable. Um, they can be controllable. The, the doctor or the, or the uh, therapist that's working with the, with the patient can understand the game and then know the kinds of situations that are going to come up, and they can use that um, to help benefit the patient. Um, as an example for the next one, um, so immersion, less, less thinking about your body. So like if you're thinking, if you, like say you uh, had, well, had an accident and you need to do some physical therapy or like walking on a treadmill, right? Um, if you're walking on the treadmill, you're sort of, there's not really much to think about except you walking on the treadmill and you're sort of thinking about all your body movements and that kind of stuff, um, which could be good. Uh, maybe you need that at what stage you're in, but if you, um, if you played, say, Beat Saber or, or sort of Dance uh, or Dance Central or something like that, uh, Wii Fit, uh, Wii Bowling, whatever, um, you're less thinking about what your body is doing, and so you might um, stretch yourself more than you would otherwise because you don't necessarily feel the muscles stretching, um, and so you might get better benefit out of it. It's the, remember the therapy aspect, having work working with the healthcare professional so that they can monitor that, because you don't want to push yourself too hard either. Um, that is a bad thing. Um, and then they're fun and engaging. So just walking on a treadmill, not that fun and engaging. Um, but if you were um, you know, playing some game, then it is fun. And that means that a healthcare professional will have, um, their patients have better um, compliance with the therapy. So they will, they will um, want to do it more um, if it's sort of at-home therapy, which a lot of therapy is, um, there's a better chance that the patient's going to do it and not just come back and say, you know, I said I didn't, I didn't do it this time because uh, I got bored or got busy or whatever, um, which can be very important. Um, types of therapy that games can help with. So these are sort of three categories that I sort of lump things into, uh, which makes sense for me. Um, there's others. There's things that fall outside these categories. There's some things that sort of maybe split between two different categories. Um, and we're going to cover each, each of these three in a little bit more depth. Um, emotional being joy and sadness. Um, and I sort of lumped the uh, pain uh, management stuff into emotional, physical being anything physical, um, and then mental being uh, mental. Um, so uh, emotional therapy. So games can evoke emotions. Um, I'm sure all of you are uh, OK with that. Um, they can give you joy. Uh, some examples of games there, Pokemon Go, Dragon Quest. Um, they can also um, evoke sadness. Uh, depending on what your goal is, um, there could be either one. Maybe you're trying to work through some feelings and a little bit of sadness is good, just sort of help you work through that. Um, maybe you're um, not feeling the best and so playing something that, that evokes joy um, could be good. Um, why do games do different things? Um, there's a lot of different um, uh, theories on that. Uh, you can get into color theory. You can get into a lot of different things. Uh, there's actually a company, um, I think they're based in Melbourne, uh, called Liminal VR um, that gets into really in-depth about the sort of core basic things about like a color or a sound or types of different bits and, and what kinds of emotions those things help you feel. Um, so they would be a great resource for that kind of stuff. But, but in general, bright colors, happy sounds, um, evoke joy. Um, you know, darker or not dark, dimmer colors, um, sadder sounds um, would do sadness. Um, procedure support. So it's a big piece of what we help hospitals with is how to use games um, in procedures um, and to help with that kind of thing. Uh, anxiety relief. I mean, it doesn't necessarily need to. So if you, if, you, if you have a kid that is getting a needle, no one really likes getting needles pricked, um, it doesn't need to be a game that completely distracts them. 
Um, they still know there's a needle being going in. They still, you know, sort of need to be aware of that so they're not, you know, moving their arm around. But it just sort of helps distract them a little bit, enough that they can think about something else via, and it doesn't need to be VR, like in this case, it could be an iPad, um, it could be whatever, um, enough to distract them a little bit so that they can sort of focus over here and then they sort of vaguely aware of something happening over here. Uh, it could be needle pricks, it could be um, burn, man uh, burn um, dressing changes are a big thing, um, that kind of stuff. Um, pain management, obviously. So um, there's the distraction aspect of pain management, but also, um, and VR is great for this, but if your brain has so much cognitive load from um, audio and visual things happening, um, you know, you're playing whatever, it could be Rocket League, it could be Beat Saber, it could be anything. Um, so much cognitive load, it doesn't have a chance to really process the pain as much. You still feel it, it's still there, um, but you're not focusing on it. You, you have so much other stuff that your brain is dealing with um, that it doesn't, it can't focus on that as much. Um, and then anesthesia replacement. So um, anesthesia is expensive um, in terms of just the drugs, but also their staff time that have to sort of manage you and make sure it's working well. Um, you have to fast before you do a lot of anesthesia. Um, which is not comfortable for the patient um, or their parents. Um, but also, um, um, yeah, so, um, so yeah, so it's expensive uh, on the hospitals and on the healthcare providers and to, um, to do anesthesia. Whereas if you have an option like VR or something that, or an iPad even, that is, um, that can be a good replacement, then, um, then that's a lot cheaper um, and a lot quicker. Um, a lot better um, patient satisfaction. They don't have, they can eat, they can, uh, don't have to go to sleep, they can, you know, just, it's less invasive. Um, delving into the pain management piece, um, there's a lot of research in this right now, um, especially in the US, I assume here as well. Um, we have a big opioid epidemic stuff, I'm assuming you guys have that as well. Um, and so there's a lot of attention being placed on, on games and specifically VR as a replacement to, to opioids. Um, there's fewer side effects, no fasting needed, we talked a lot about this already, uh, cheaper, and there's, there's quite a lot, like I said, quite a bit of research um, that's saying that um, either it is a replacement or it can be, um, you can use a lot less opioids um, um, if you use VR and such. Um, and, and specifically, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, VR experiences that are specifically designed for healthcare. It could be um, just off the shelf things. Um, so yeah, um, distraction. Um, obviously hospitals are boring and stressful. Um, this is a patient in the UK that, that we did a visit over there um, and set him up with some Fruit Ninja. Um, and he was, uh, I had a little video, but I didn't want to throw it in because it was, um, well, it was very, very long and very good quality, but this was my phone. Um, but, um, but yeah, but he just really got into the stuff and he totally forgot about the, um, the pain that he was feeling before he sort of got it. He wasn't really, um, he was sort of iffy on, on playing it all because he wasn't feeling very well. Um, calming as well, um, there's a big piece about just normalizing hospital stays. Um, if a, if a, you know, you're an adult and you have to go to the hospital, you can sort of, um, deal with it, you know that like I'm here because it's good for me. Um, if you're a kid, that's harder to understand sometimes, um, especially if you don't have the games that you like to play at home to play. Um, honestly, even if like, if I was to go into the hospital, I would want to have some games as well because it is boring and stressful uh, and the distraction is great. Um, and then self-care. So um, renewvr.com is, is a great site I found a while ago. They have a ton of, um, VR apps, both paid and free for all sorts of platforms, everything from, you know, Vive and Oculus all the way down to Google Cardboard. Um, and just, and by different categories, you can like meditation, um, you know, uh, mindfulness, um, so all kinds of different categories of different apps for, for um, health care purposes, healthy purposes. Um, and just pick me up. So they have, um, like one, for example, that you should do before you get in front of a panel of speaker or talking people um, that sort of helps get your energy up and get your brain in the right place. Um, yeah, so physical therapy. Um, 
physical therapy, so there's some things that are important in physical therapy. So um, you want well, your repetition, right? So you're working on, um, you know, uh, closing your hand around um, stuff because you had a broken hand or whatever. Um, you have to sort of do that over and over and over. Um, you have to sort of push your limits, right, beyond what um, you might think is comfortable, um, but not too hard. You don't want to um, further damage whatever things, muscles or bones or whatever that you're working on. Um, being creative is important, so um, thinking up creative ways to try to, because because it's so repetitive, um, you have to try to think up different creative ways to do it to help the compliance aspect, so the, getting the patient to want to do it. Um, and then obviously you're trying to regain your abilities. Um, I have a little video um, that I'm going to show. Um, I'll just let them, I guess, talk. Well, I'll just explain. So this is um, at Michigan, um, University of Michigan. This is the, it's a physical therapy lab where they use games um, to help with the therapy specifically. Uh, oops, no. Ah, no way. There. There. Hi, I'm Rob Ferguson, and this is Sandy Dodge. We work at Michigan Medicine in the Computer Therapy Lab on inpatient rehabilitation at University Hospital. In the Computer Therapy Lab, we generally see patients between 17 or 18 years old to as, as old as we've had uh, patients in here who are in their mid to late 90s. Uh, they may be in here for uh, stroke rehabilitation, might be here because they've had a brain injury, spinal cord injury, uh, amputation. Uh, we pretty much will see anybody who has therapeutic goals to work on. So if they have goals where they're working on being able to take care of themselves again, feeding themselves, bathing themselves, dressing themselves, getting in and out of bed, um, standing, getting in and out of their chair, um, preparing their meals or doing things around their house. We use the technology to give them a lot of extra intensity and repetition that they might not be able to get in their traditional setting, um, but it only builds capacity. The, the technology is a tool to help prepare them for their occupational therapy and physical therapy treatments where they actually learn to do those things. We take whatever the game is and we match it with the patient's abilities. So say they need to, they want to work on feeding themselves again. They can't bring their hand to their mouth we will set the technology up to require them to do that motion. We may use an exoskeleton to make the arm lighter, to make it easier for them to coordinate the movement, and then we'll put some kind of interface between their hand and their face and work towards bringing their hand closer. Everybody who comes through has a different goal, and for someone with a stroke, they could be in here for a physical goal, uh, like a movement goal, coordination. Sometimes it's thinking skills, and sometimes it's visual related skills. They either have difficulty paying attention to one side or they can't see and they're learning a strategy to compensate for that. And so it's an opportunity for them to reinforce some of the skills that they're learning in their traditional treatment session, but to get enough repetition and intensity to learn over and carry over in a new situation. My favorite day is when a patient comes into a computer therapy lab session and says, guess what I was able to do because of what they did in here. It gave them that extra capacity to brush their hair even. Something as simple that we take for granted every day is brushing your hair, your teeth, or feeding yourself, or putting your shirt on. And when they say, I finally did it, that to me makes a good day. So that's excellent examples of how hospitals are using, um, using games in physical therapy stuff. Um, some games that I've seen or some things that I've seen the hospitals do um, very successfully. Um, Beat Saber obviously is super fun um, and has um, pretty uniform movements. You know, it's not, um, you know what the, the physical therapists know what the movements are going to be. Um, and so it can be useful for, for certain kinds of uh, need to working on your arms. Um, but we also have a hospital, actually uh, same hospital, um, they use it, they call it feet saber. So they'll, they'll sit a kid down or, or adult down in a chair, um, strap the controllers to their feet and then have them work on their feet, trying to play beat saber with their feet, um, which is, I assume, much harder. Um, I haven't actually tried it. Um, but any game with the right controllers can be physical therapy. I um, mean, you saw, you know, he's playing Rocket League with these buttons way up here and, and uh, mouth controllers and stuff. Um, you know, it's all about trying to be creative and figuring out how to set up the controllers in the right way, um, which used to be um, 
that used to be very expensive tools and very difficult. Um, how, many, how many people are familiar with the Xbox Adaptive Controller that came out recently? Cool. Um, so those of you that aren't, um, the Adaptive Controller is something that Xbox came out with um, just over a year ago. Um, it is a, a first party device. Um, it, it's a, you know, it's just a controller. Uh, it's not even really, technically it's more of a junction box. Um, it has some buttons and switches on it, but really it just has lots of ports where you can plug in a device. It could be a button, it could be a, uh, a big full joystick, it could be a um, motion sensitive thing, it could be a light touch, tiny little button. Um, but all the switches on a normal Xbox controller have an analog in there. So you can plug in something that works for any of those and then that is your controller. And then you can maneuver and stick those those buttons and switches wherever you need, whatever is accessible for you. So it's a great tool. Um, it's, um, it works for Xbox and, and Windows 10, of course. Um, there are some adapters you can get to make it work with a switch. Um, and I've heard there's some hacks you can do to get to work with, a, with the PlayStation as well, but uh, I haven't, haven't played with that myself. Um, the Wii Anything is pretty useful for, for physical therapy stuff. Depends on, on again, what your goals are. Um, and then 3DS, um, there's a couple, um, and I always forget the name of the issue, but there's, there's like a vision issue that, that people can have where the, the therapy is look at something close and then look at something far away and then look at something close and look at something far away over and over for like 20 minutes a day. Um, and they found that playing the 3DS in 3D mode um, gave you that same, uh, gave your eyes that same exercise such that your therapy was literally go play your 3DS for 20 minutes a day at least, um, and then you, you know, hopefully will get better. So um, that's a great example of how, um, how a tool that was not designed for it can be used as a, um, or a game that was not designed for it can be used as a, as a therapy tool. Um, mental therapy. So um, there's lots of different um, uh, ways that games can be used um, in mental therapy. So um, PTSD, um, the various Department of Defense, I know that American and Australian, I'm sure others, um, have lots of stuff where they um, research and, and practice where they have uh, a first person game, um, say, um, that is a street and the, and the, the patient is walking down the street um, and, and this is the kind of thing, I'll get into this later, but it's the kind of thing definitely where you have a um, physician working with you to sort of help control it. It's not the kind of thing you just want to do it yourself. Where they can control the amount of, say, traffic on the street, the amount of other people, um, sounds on the street, to sort of help the patient work through their, um, uh, their challenges. Um, phobias as well, uh, again, you don't want to just like throw a patient into like, um, uh, Richie's plank, which is like you standing on top of a giant skyscraper if they're afraid of heights and say, you're going to be fixed, just figure this out. Um, but it can be a tool to sort of work through that and get to that point. Um, then social skills, um, there's a lot of, and this, um, delving into the analog games, because uh, not all games are digital. Um, role-playing games like D&D can be great tools for um, helping patients work on social skills. Um, there's a group in, in uh, Seattle area where I live um, called Game to Grow that uses, um, they have been doing for years, using Dungeons and Dragons basically as group therapy for uh, kids that are mostly, um, most of them are on the autism spectrum in some way, but not all. Mo the basic um, criteria is this, this patient, need, or this patient, needs to work on some social skill. Um, and they have, um, it is paid therapy, it's, it's um, you know, they're professionals, um, it's guided, it's, it's uh, in many ways, um, D&D and great is great for social skills for anyone, um, obviously without having any of that, but if you have, you know, specifically designed encounters, specifically designed uh, character interactions, um, a facilitator, a, a GM that is trained and knows when to when there's a breakthrough about to happen and they can stop the game and, and sort of take a look back and say, okay, let's talk about this for a second, um, it can be a great tool. Uh, and then stress relief. I think mean, everyone that plays games probably has some games that they go to when they need to like de-stress. Um, and that game is different for everyone. Sometimes it's um, something like Peggle or uh, Tetris. Um, for some people it's, it's The Sims or 
um, Doom or uh, whatever, Call of Duty, uh, whatever that sort of person's stress relief is, but um, they can be great for that. Um, I said, um, best under a doctor therapist intervention or supervision. Um, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of benefit in games, um, but again, just like playing Richie's Plank when you're on top of the thing to try to help someone with, with phobias is not necessarily the right thing. So um, definitely having a doctor therapist uh, supervision is important. Um, and they will help you then reinforce lessons learned, um, talk with you out of the game and, and help guide um, what games you want to do, and then um, on the flip side, they need to understand the tool. So if they don't understand the tool, they can't prescribe it. Um, dangers in the area, so um, too much of a good thing. So um, escape is good, um, you know, from whatever uh, issues you might be having, um, but hiding from the real world, playing games at the, the exclusion of social interaction and job and work and all that kind of stuff is not good, so not healthy. So the down balance is definitely important, um, understanding the balance and, and then, you know, working with someone to help you manage that um, is great. Who even uses therapeutic games? So there's tons of, um, I say tons now, there are more and more every year um, sort of geek therapists, so um, folks that are um, psychologists, psychiatrists, therapists, um, understand um, you know, the medical need of that, um, trained in that, but are also geeks themselves. They understand the benefits of games and the difference between different games um, and what you mean when you say, you know, you, you I don't know, soloed, um, Something uh, my brain can't think of it right now. A good example, but um, but yeah, they they um, they can be great at that. Uh, and there's more and more every year. I assume there's some in here, um, in no one. Uh, there's definitely some in the Seattle area, um, and there's a bunch of them online. Um, patient gaming tech specialists are um, folks that work in a hospital or a clinical environment. Um, and our, their job is to be the resident gamer, effectively. Um, to, they're not IT, they don't support the desktops and all that kind of stuff. Um, they support the, the game equipment or the, or the distraction equipment. Um, there are um, probably 16 of them in the world that I know right now. Um, but part of Child's Play's mission is to actively create more of those. So we've, we've done 14 grants in the last uh, couple years, um, and several people are doing that role that didn't come from grants of ours, and we want to get to the point where, um, where there's a lot more of those, and it just becomes a, a natural thing, like every hospital needs doctors and nurses, and you also need this person. Um, Department of Defense people, um, both in the US, here, and all over the world, are doing lots of um, work with this. Um, they have a lot of, um, I have I've seen the benefit of, the, of, of games and technology and simulation, so. Um, and then but ultimately everyone. Um, I would love for everyone to, to use games as a tool, not as, to the exclusion of other tools. Um, there are lots of other great tools for, for therapeutic use, um, but it should be in the toolkit um, used to its full extent when, when it becomes the best tool. Um, how to make games therapeutic. So. The first piece is make it fun. So if, if, a, if a tool is not fun, and I'm sure everyone has probably played um, either educational games or, or serious games that are not fun, then it's just another tool and it, you lose a lot of the benefit of the game aspect of it. Um, I guess it could still technically be a game, but if it's not fun, then you don't, lose, you don't have that, that patient compliance piece, um, which is so important. Um, Talk to some professionals about the field that you want to target. So, um, you know, if you want to make a physical therapy game, talk to some physical therapists. If you want to make a, um, you know, a mental game, mental therapy game, you know, talk to some uh, psychiatrists, psychologists. Um, if you want to make a, whatever kind of game you want to make, um, talk to some people in that field um, to learn the kinds of things that they try to do um, and what kinds of things would be useful. Uh, read some books. There's lots of great books. Um, there's one um, working with video games uh, and video gamers, sorry, and games in therapy, uh, which is pretty good. Um, gets pretty in depth in lots of different areas. Um, 
And then obviously podcasts, um, Checkpoint has a great mental health series uh, on how to use games in the mental health industry uh, or mental health realm um, and what kinds of things can be good in, in them. Uh, and then honestly, don't worry about it too much because it's, like I said, a lot of the games that are being used as therapeutic tools right now were not originally designed for that. So if you, if you even think a little bit about it as you're making games and into what, you know, if you, if you want to target some aspect of therapy um, and you think a little bit about it, um, that's probably great. Um, you know, then it's just getting it out there and sort of giving some copies to some therapists and being like, hey, would this be useful? Um, and honestly, actually, I didn't put it as a point on here, but um, getting some therapists as your, as some test people, beta testers, um, would be great, right? Like, let them sort of have early access. Is it useful? What kinds of things would not be useful or, or, or what kind of changes you might be able to make to make it more useful? Um, and then that's really it. Um, questions? Any questions about anything I talked about or, or aspects of this? Yeah. Does child play make bespoke games for um, hospitals and other therapeutic centers? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we don't. Um, we have five staff, um, and actually, two years ago, and for most of our history, we only had two staff. So, um, so we don't do that. But we do um, provide grants to some hospitals and and folks that want to make games. So we've done, um, I guess, we've done apps so far. They've all been. I think all the grants we've done so far are apps, but um, but yeah, um, it's it's the kind of thing we want to encourage. But um, because there's so many great games out there, um, we don't feel like we need to necessarily make more ourselves. I mean, we're not game developers um, by any stretch, um, but we do want happily want to provide those resources to to folks that do want it. Or or and we have I've done lots of times um, uh, because I sort of straddle both sides of the healthcare industry and the the game industry. Um, I've done lots of times is introduce a, a game developer person to a hospital that is interested and be like, here you go, you go forth and, you know, make a great thing or at least chat about it, um, which has been very successful. So that's, that's often what we do is we sort of are the, the matchmakers, I guess, um, more so. Or, or, like I said, sometimes provide resources. Other questions? I think yours is first. Um, do you believe that VR will be the future of this space when it comes to games and therapy? Um, it's a good question. Um, I think I think it will grow in the future for sure. I mean, you know, the future is long, and who knows what's out there after VR? Uh, maybe it'll be just you know, direct implant um, interface or whatever. Um, the, the challenges with VR are, I mean, it's a great tool, and we would happily, like, Child's Play would happily send VR to every hospital we knew, except that most of them would just sit under a desk and not get used, um, because they are a little complicated. There is some, you know, barrier to entry there. Um, and hospitals in general are conservative organizations. Like, any change is potentially dangerous to their patients, so they have to evaluate every change very carefully, um, which is fine. Like, that's, that's a good thing. Um, so yeah, I, I think it will definitely, like the, the hospitals that are using VR, which is, I mean, well, the hospitals that are using uh, sort of off the shelf VR, call it, um, is maybe, maybe there's 15 or so in the world that I know about, yeah, maybe more, maybe, maybe 20 or 25. Um, there are more and more healthcare companies, um, there's probably a dozen at least, that are creating VR, um, headsets and or experiences specifically targeted for um, uh, hospital situations. I mean, and that's, that's more than just like, like single developer made a single thing for this one hospital, like that are making sort of stuff for, for uh, and that's like kind VR, applied VR, uh, little seed, um, I don't know, there's lots of them. Um, but so yeah, I, I think it is, it is a great tool and it will be used more and more. But there are situations, so, so say you're getting a needle prick, right, or a wound change. Um, I don't, I mean, everyone who's been in VR and then had someone touch you while you're in VR, it can be very disconcerting. Like, you're like, whoa, what is that? Like, it, it sort of brings you out. And so for a lot of people, um, if for the sort of procedure uh, replacement or procedure pain uh, distraction tool, VR is not the answer because they like to be able to see what's happening and, and know when someone's going to touch them. Um, for that, an iPad might be a better tool. 
um, just because then they can sort of see. So it, it, it's just a tool. I think it will definitely become more popular because it is a super powerful tool. Um, I mean, it's, you know, as far as, yeah, but it is a tool. As far as being able to escape the four walls of your hospital if you're stuck there for a month or a year or multiple years, I mean, VR, there's nothing better than VR at this point. So, um, so yeah, uh, yeah, it'll be definitely become more and more. Um, I don't think it'll ever become the thing that everyone uses because it does have some limitations, for sure. Um, obviously, with the the rap that games can sometimes get in traditional media, do you find it's challenging to engage hospitals and hospital staff with using games as a therapeutic tool? Um, do you find there's pushback if they don't understand the medium as well as they might need to? Um, it's, yeah, I mean, so usually the people that we're talking to are the child life or play therapists, which are the people that are, for those that aren't familiar, um, they're in charge of like the playroom and any consoles that are there and, and explaining surgeries and procedures to kids so that they can sort of understand what's happening, that kind of stuff. And for the, you know, most of them have seen the benefit of games to their patients. They may not have like the quantity of like benefits like written down or anything, but they've seen that, you know, here is Johnny and, and he was real sad and then he played a game and then he was real happy. Um, and, and they've seen that. So it's, it's not too hard usually to explain to them the benefits. And we have, uh, actually I brought some, uh, a little booklet um, that is, it's our therapeutic video game guide, but it sort of breaks down um, certain games that are great for pain or sadness or anxiety and different things like that. And we find that when we give it to them, they're like, here is the thing that like validates this stuff I've been seeing. Um, which isn't to say that hospitals in general are embracing. I mean, anyone that's not the child's or the the, the um, play therapists or child life department, um, they often like their administration, their bosses, that kind of stuff. It's often difficult to get them to buy in. Um, there's a couple things that are helping with that. One is that there are enough hospitals um, moving forward with this that um, eventually one of the big things that drives hospitals is what is that other hospital that got rated higher than us doing that we need to do? Um, and we have enough highly rated hospitals um, that are starting to, to use games very well um, that I have faith that within a reasonable short time, um, more will start using it. The other aspect is that the medical uh, healthcare sort of industry, the vendor industry, is diving into this in a real big way. And you know, they're, they have a lot of experience selling things to hospitals, and so they're going to have all the backup and, and you know, research studies and evidence and whatever needed to be able to sort of convince um, administrations and stuff that here are things that are great. Um, so for both angles, um, it will continue to grow. I have, I have faith in that. Um, it, there will always be people like, we're just in the UK, I, this, and not, nothing about the UK, but it happened to be in the UK. There was one child life uh, manager we met that she wanted, she, um, her, the policy there was no screen time for any kids under 12, which was pretty extreme. Um, we hadn't seen anything like that before. Um, I mean, certainly there's a, there's a point at which, you know, maybe no screen time um, and a point at which, you know, you sort of manage screen time, but 12, 12 and under seemed pretty extreme. But, you know, that's one person out of, uh, I don't know, well, I visited like 60 hospitals in the last couple of years, so. Uh, and when Child's Play in general has visited 125, I think now, the last couple of years. So, um, so yeah, yeah, uh, it will get better. Other questions? Cool. Uh, well, thank you for coming. Uh, I super appreciate it. And I'll be around outside and whatnot. If you have other questions, happy to have cards and I have my guide and stuff. Um, and I'll be around. So, cool. Thank you. <laughs>